and welcome back. So now with this third session, we are going to talk a little bit about the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, we'll touch on the Ramayana uh, and the sutras, and then we're going to go to the Devi Mahatmya and talk a little bit about the goddess scriptures as well. So my understanding is that you'll be diving into the Bhagavad Gita um, sometime after the new year, I believe. And so today I'm just going to focus on a couple of lessons from three of the chapters. Uh, but a few things to know is the Bhagavad Gita translates to the Song of God. And again, as we discussed earlier, this text is um, a conversation a divine conversation between a person named Arjuna, who was a warrior. He was the, he was uh, mastered the bow and arrow, and he was in the midst of the beginnings of a war. And the war was between his family, his five brothers, he and his brothers, there were five of them, and his cousins, and there were hundreds of them. And what happened was, in brief, their father was the king of a kingdom and went blind. And during that time, there was a rule, a law, uh -huh. that kings couldn't be blind. So, Arjuna's father turned the kingdom temporarily over to his brother, Arjuna's uncle, and said, take care of the kingdom until my eldest is old enough to take the throne and then give it back. And the brother, of course, acknowledged this. But as time went by, the cousins, well, they became accustomed to being in charge, to being part of the family that was running things. And eventually, that king went blind. And when he did, he put his eldest son on the throne because Arjuna's older brother wasn't yet old enough. But as he was approaching that age where he would have been able to take over and rightfully do so, suddenly the cousins started to try to cheat the kingdom away from the Pandava brothers, from Arjuna and his brothers. They did things, you know, they, they tried to win at dice. They knew that the one brother had a little bit of a gambling issue and so sat him down with a game and, and it ended up that he, he actually bet his right to the throne. <laughs> yeah. And the game was rigged and so he lost the kingdom. And in addition to that, they had to leave. Arjuna and his brothers had to leave the area for a prolonged period of time. And no one was able to see them. They could come back, potentially 10 years or so it was, as long as no one saw them. But if even one person saw them and recognized them, then they would be exiled forever. After some to do, the brothers leave, they accept the outcome, they go on their way, and when the time comes for them to return, they do. When they return, the brother, the, the cousin rather, who had taken control of the throne said, but you didn't live up to our agreement because someone did see you and recognized you, and therefore you have now forfeit everything. You have no right to even be here. And the brother said, no, no, actually, that's not the way that it happened. And, and there was a little bit of, a, of an argument that goes with that. And then the cousin said something to the effect of, you cannot even stay alive. You cannot stay here and you cannot stay alive. We'll have a battle to finish this. So 
Arjuna and his cousin, they have another cousin or a friend, depending upon what commentary it is that you're reading. And this person happens to be Krishna, you know, who is the Godhead. And so the story says that Krishna was resting. And first, the eldest cousin walks into the room, walks around the bed and walks up to Krishna's side by his head. Arjuna walks in the room and stands at Krishna's feet. Krishna is stirred from his rest and the first thing he sees is Arjuna. So he says, hey, what's up? The cousin over here says, oh, no, I was here first. He said, but I saw Arjuna first. So the humility of Arjuna going to the feet and not going up to the head. So meeting somebody up here, you know, walking up to, to his head is a confrontational behavior. Being at the feet is a humble behavior. So they explained what was going on. They said, look, there's going to be a battle. They want the kingdom back, but they lost the kingdom fair and square. And now we're here to ask for your help. So Krishna says, well, I don't like to take sides. So what I'll do is this. I'll give one of you my armies. And his armies were, you know, the best, the, the most masterful armies there ever were. And the other one, I'll be your charioteer, but I won't fight. And he said, you know, Arjun, I saw you first, so you should choose first. And the cousin had a little hissy fit. He said, no, he said, I saw him first. He went, he was there, it's, you know. And so Arjun said, well, there's no question. I want you as my charioteer. That's all I need. And so the cousin ended up with the armies and thought that, well, that means we've won hand down. So the day comes when they're going to, to engage in this battle and they go to a place called Kurukshetra. And back then, battles were much different than what they, they are today. They were gentlemanly battles, like they didn't fight before or after, you know, a certain time. And, you know, there were, there were, there were um, principles in place about families and things like that. Not that everybody kept to them, but, but generally speaking, there was an art to war at that time. And so one of the things is that, you know, the, the leader of one side would, would ride out on the chariot to the middle of the battlefield and take an assessment before everything started. And then once the assessment was made, they would blow through the conch shell and that would indicate everybody start. So Arjuna says to Krishna, bring me out to the center of the battlefield. And Krishna says, are you sure? Arjuna says, yep, take me out. I want to see who's come here. Who, who is on each side? I want, I want to see. So he goes, Krishna brings him out in the chariot to the center of the battlefield. Arjuna looks up to the one side, sees his brothers, some of his teachers, but not many of them because most were on the other side. Most of them, his, his cousins, his beloved teachers from when he was a child, members of the community, were all up on the side with the cousins, even though the cousins were crooked. Because in that day and age, you know, you stood by your king even if your king was crooked. Well, Arjuna looks one way, he looks the other way, and then he drops his bow and he breaks down. And he says to Krishna, I can't do this. I, I cannot fight a battle where so much blood of so many people who I love would, would be spilled. There's no kingdom in the world that's worth this. There's no kingdom, there's nothing. I would rather they kill me first and put an end to this atrocity. And that's called Arjuna's dilemma, is that here he is, a skilled warrior. You could say that being the warrior or standing up for righteousness is his dharma. And here he is saying, no, his mind has become disturbed. And he's now questioning himself. He's doubting the validity of his own place, of his own purpose. So initially, Krishna plays a little bit to his ego. You know, he says, well, you know, 
you were born and raised to be a warrior. And if you don't do this, you know, you're going to spoil your family's name. You're going to be dishonored. People are going to talk. And Arjuna said, I don't care. I'm not doing this. Arjuna's rebuttal to Krishna was along the lines of, if this happens, the kingdom will fail. The women will be stained. Ethics will be lost. And nothing will ever be the same. And Krishna's reply, and I'm paraphrasing, was basically, you're mistaken. That's already happening. That's already happening. You're here because it's your dharma to support righteousness, to support ethic, to support goodness. You're not here to throw your bow down in a moment of difficult discomfort. They start talking. Arjuna says, well, maybe I'll be a renunciate. Maybe I'll, I'll give up this life. That must be the answer. And Krishna said, you'll be a renunciate. You weren't, you weren't raised to be a renunciate. You weren't, that's not your calling. It's better to do your own work and fail miserably than to do the work of another and succeed. You're who you are, so be you, walk your path, do your work, dot your I's, cross your T's. Uncomfortable? Yes, it is. But this is what it is. And so they go forward into this discussion of karma and knowledge and devotion. Action, karma, knowledge, jnana, devotion, bhakti. And in chapter 2, which is the chapter on Sankhya Yoga, Krishna talks about the five causes of suffering. They're called kleshas. Patabi Joyce, who is the, uh, responsible for the um, Ashtanga Yoga, the modern version of Ashtanga Yoga, Patabi Joyce called them the poisons of the heart. The five poisons of the heart. And they are ignorance, egoism, preference, aversion, and fear of death. Ignorance, avidya. Egoism, ashmita. The story of me. I, 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 I. Preference, raga. Aversion, divesha. And fear of death, abhinivesha. Of these, some people say, Avidya, ignorance, is the primary one. Others say fear of death, Abhinivesha, is the primary one. Because why do we become ignorant? Because we're afraid of change. Yeah. We're afraid of what we don't know. A sage, according to the Bhagavad Gita, is a being who experiences consistent satisfaction in the self, freedom from attachment, aversion, fear, and anger, evenness of mind and withdrawal of the senses. And he said, oh, Arjuna, you don't fit that bill. <sighs> you know, you, right now your mind is so absolutely disturbed that you're missing the whole point of this. And if we go to chapter 6, which is on page 15 of your handout, I included there two verses. Arjuna said, For Krishna... The mind is very unsteady, turbulent, tenacious, and powerful. Therefore, I consider it as difficult to control as the wind. And Krishna replied, The mind is restless, no doubt, and difficult to curb, Arjuna. But it can be brought under control by repeated practice of meditation and by exercise of dispassion or detachment. And here we see that there's a return to the discussion of what a practice is, what is a sadhana, and what is surrender, or control of the senses, or detachment. 
we see these two topics coming up in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. We see it in the Bhagavad Gita. We see it in the Devi Mahatmya. We see it in the Ramayana. Across the board, these two concepts of practice and detachment are absolutely important. Patanjali says your practice needs to be consistent over a long period of time with little to no interruption and great enthusiasm. The practice needs to be consistent over a long period of time with little to no interruption and with great enthusiasm. And when your practice, your sadhana, has that bhav, has that quality, then dispassion or detachment is easy. It's not that you back away and say, I don't care. It's not that you become cold. It's that you recognize you have the knowledge inside of yourself that is alive and recognizes that some things don't require your input, some things do require your input, and your input is simply dotting your I's, crossing your T's, and acting in a way that's in line with your Dharma, that's in line with bringing you to a greater stability, a greater place of peace, a greater connection to the divine and to all things that are of that. Even in these great, these great scriptures, these great sacred writings, I'm always so very touched at the absence of anger. It's not that it's not there. But when Arjuna is talking about, you know, this war, he's not saying they were wrong. Da, 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 da. They did this. They did that. Da, 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 da. They're going to get what they deserve. He's not being driven by that. He's not being driven by his emotions into the war, but he is being driven by his emotions out of it. So here, he's shirking his personal responsibility by not wanting to follow his dharma. That's a really long conversation. I can see some of you perked up and went, what? By not engaging in this war, he's turning his back on his responsibility. Yeah. He's saying, I don't want the responsibility on my shoulders. Yeah. It's not a call for war. And Krishna is very clear about that also. He says to him, your mistake is this. Your mistake is that you think you die. You think that they're going to die. But the reality is you don't because the essence of you and the essence of them will go on forever. This embodiment will, will end, but it's already done. It's already done. And there's a lot of discussion about what that means. Does that mean that there's fate? Like our destiny is set and there's nothing we can do about it? And I read it a little bit differently. My guru, Swami Adiyatmanandaji, has said what he's basically saying there is this human body is going to die. That's all. Whether it's on the battlefield, whether it's in a hospital, whether it's whatever, it's going to happen. Why are you focusing on that? It's going. You know it is. There's nothing you can do to change it. So why are you focusing on it? Focus on what you can change. Focus on what you can do. And what you can do is bring stability back. You can bring goodness. You can be the goodness. Be the Dharma. Live the Dharma. And don't worry about the coming and going of the physical body. Instead, concern yourself with the resolution of karma so that next time around you return in a more favorable position to continuing your spiritual inquiry from a place of knowing more and being ignorant of less. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Abhyasa and Viragya. 
There are stages to viragya, the dispassion. There can be no spiritual process progress without it. So the first thing is attempt to control preferences and understand how those preferences influence our actions. That requires svadhyaya, self-study. It requires that we sit and pay attention even when we're not comfortable. We need to know what our preferences are. I prefer uh, coffee over tea, right? No big deal, but why? Because there's a lot of difference there. You know, coffee is caffeinated, herbal tea is not. What is it about my choice there that's driving me to the caffeine, to the thing that might not be as good for me as the other thing, to the thing that might actually be a little harmful? What is it? So that we can understand, we don't necessarily have to change the behavior, although eventually we may want to, but to at least understand, have a broader view of ourselves. Renouncing desires, but look, don't become a renunciate, you know, because it won't last, but maybe five hours. Yeah, instead, one little tiny thing, one little thing at a time, that's all. You know what? You have a hard time practicing in the morning when you wake up, wake up five minutes earlier and commit to five minutes of practice. Then next week, commit to six. Then next week, commit to seven, then to 10 then to 15, and eventually you'll get to a very long practice. Little changes. You want to become a vegetarian? Don't do so overnight. You'll suffer. Your body will suffer. Your gut will suffer. Your, your mind will become disturbed. You want to be a vegetarian? Do not do it while you're in yoga teacher training. <laughs> so many people do it while they're in yoga teacher training. Oh, they suffer so much. I feel so... So sad sometimes, <laughs> but it's, you know, it's their karma, so it's okay. But, um, I'll, you know, but do it at a time where you're clear, clear about your intention and a little bit at a time so that your body doesn't get shocked, so that your nervous system doesn't get overwhelmed. And I'm a vegetarian and I think the whole world should be a vegetarian, but the reality is the whole world is not vegetarian. And they're probably not going to be either. So do we condemn people because they make different choices? No. We just try to live our life to the best goodness possible that we can and to the least harm that we can. That includes the animal and the person who eats the animal. Attain absolute control over desire even though the desire might still be there. If any of you are ex-smokers, you know what that's like. Okay. Yeah. So the desire is still there, but you don't act on it. You just acknowledge it. You know? Teach yourself a different way. And then absence of distraction. So this absence of distraction, eventually, if you put these other three into play, eventually, the, the seduction of the cigarette won't even really be there anymore. Eventually, it'll just be indifference to it. So for dispassion, sometimes people get a little concerned and they say, well, I don't really want to be detached because that's a psychological issue. It's only a psychological issue if you're stuffing yourself, if you're stuffing it, if you're saying, I don't care, or as my daughter sometimes does, talk to the hand mom. You know? Detachment from the emotional reaction to things actually opens you up to an entirely new way of seeing the world. It opens you up to the freedom of loving completely, 100%, without expectation. It alleviates disappointment and it alleviates expectation. So when we say detachment, we say, you know, instead of judging you, I can now appreciate you. Instead of criticizing you, I can now be grateful for your strength. Instead of condemning you, I can now recognize your resiliency. Instead of competing with you, I can now partner with you. Instead of trying to outdo you, I can now work to lift both of us up. And very wise words of the Buddha, 
and of many other teachers. As long as there is a single being still suffering in this realm, we will not be able to maintain peace in our hearts and minds. It is only when all beings are liberated, free of suffering, into a sense of unity and oneness that we will become enlightened. So this Varagya, there's a story that's oftentimes told about a man who gets into his boat and he decides that he's wanting to row down the river to go to another town. And he's in the boat and he's rowing and rowing and the sun goes down and he's rowing and he's rowing and he's rowing all night long to try to to get down to this town. And the sun comes up the next morning and he's still rowing and then he looks up and he, he sees this gentleman on the beach that he knows from his town and he says, hey, good fellow, what are you doing down here? Why did you come all this way? I could have given you a ride in my boat. And he said, man, you're still tied to the dock. (laughs) <laughs> yeah you got to detach from the thing that's holding you there you know yeah. otherwise you'd be rowing all night and you won't go anywhere how many of you are familiar with Durga Durga Ma Jagadamba mother of the universe oh goodness yay I love this okay so you know there's Shiva and Shakti yeah. Durga is also called the one that is difficult to reach, the protector, the slayer of demons, the slayer of the buffalo demon, the mother of the universe. And in her time, embodied time. Whenever she came to us, she came to us predominantly to get rid of some demons that were causing issues. So the Devi Mahatmya is a Shakta scripture that talks about the story of Durga and all the other goddesses too. So it goes through the goddesses as Devi, so in all of her manifestations. And it starts with the three main gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And there is a a person with hurtful tendencies, a little bit of a demon. And he's manipulating Brahma. He's, He's doing a thousand years of prayer to Brahma in order to get a benefit from him, in order to get what's called a boon. And so he goes to Brahma. He says, look, he says, I've been your devotee for a thousand years. And I, it's a, you know, could I have something? Could I have a gift from you? And Brahma said, well, what do you want? He said, well, immortality. And Brahma said, no. Even the gods can't be immortal. Even the gods, when they're physically manifested, have to die. They can't stay forever. He said, uh, think about it, ask me for something else. So he thinks about it, and he comes back and he says, well, so then let's make it so that no man, no disease, no poison can kill me. Brahma says, okay. As soon as he received this boon that he could be killed by no man, no poison, and no disease, he started to wreak havoc in the world. He started to tumble kingdoms, exploit people, kill, maim, the whole nine yards. A number of other gods and kings came together and they went to Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva and they said, what did he do? He he gave this demon this ability. He's not afraid of any of us anymore. Because we can't touch him, we can't hurt him, we can't kill him, we can't do anything to him. you got to do something. So they stood around in a circle, and they created a great fire called a yagna. 
And one by one, they started to offer their mastery into the fire. So one offered control of energy. Another offered the bow and arrow. Another offered the mace, which is a club. Another offered the sword. One by one, all of these gods and kings started throwing all of these things into the fire, swaha as offerings, swaha, swaha. Eventually the fire grew very, very big and bright. And from the fire stepped out a lion carrying a goddess. She was beautiful, long black hair, a red sari, gold adornments, brilliant, brilliant. And she looked at them and she said, why have you called me? She didn't say, why'd you create me? She said, why have you called me? And they said, dear mother, this is what happened. They told her the story and they said, would you take care of it, please? And she said, of course I will. But she didn't just go kill this demon. Instead, she had compassion. So Shakti, remember, Durga's Shakti. Shakti is the energy of all things. Shakti is the only thing that can really control Shakti because it's all her choice. So she could have went, you're done. But she didn't. Instead, she climbed to the top of a hill and appeared as a, a cowherd girl. And this demon's assistant had saw her and he ran back to his master and said you think you have all the most beautiful women all the greatest kingdoms but you don't have the most beautiful woman because she's on a hilltop over there and so the the demon king said then go get her bring her to me i must have all of the beauty, all of the riches, all of everything. And if I don't have her, then I don't have all of it. So go bring her, drag her by her hair if you have to. So this messenger goes to Durga, not knowing, of course, who she is, and says to her, my master would like you to come with me to marry him. And I wouldn't say no if I were you, because, well, he'll send his armies. And she said, no. And he said, you don't want to say no. And she said, silly me, when I was a young maiden, I made a vow that I would only marry the man who could beat me in battle. So please go tell your lord, your king, that I'm here and I'm willing, but he has to come. And he has to beat me in battle. So the messenger goes back and tells him this. And instead of coming himself and addressing Durga face to face, he sends his two lieutenants, Madhu and Kaitab. Madhu means sweet, Kaitab means bitter. He sent sweet versus bitter so that she might have a preference for him. He tried to convolute her focus, her discipline, her dedication, her bhakti, and reorient it. And Durga slayed them. She slayed Madhu and Kaitab. The messenger went back and said, it didn't work. She, she put those demons out cold. Now Madhu and Kaitab, they are sweet and bitter. And those two demons are associated with the Muladhara chakra, the root chakra. Now when you think about it, what is sweet and bitter? They're opposites. And you prefer one over the other? Do you like sweet or bitter? Sweet. 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 Bitter. Very good. So sweet versus bitter. And this preference is enough 
to disturb the mind and to cause us to feel unstable, unsafe, insecure, doubtful, and hopeless. And Durga teaches us how to slay that. She teaches us how to end it. And in that one instance, it's not gradual. It's not, you know, I'll give up my preferences a little at a time. In that instance, it's an immediate. It's make the choice to stop being guided by preference. And that opens up our hearts and our minds to a whole nother level of spiritual inquiry. Well, you know, the demon king wasn't happy. So what did he do? He sent the next round of lieutenants. Did he come himself to face Durga? No. Now remember in the Bhagavad Gita, what did we say? It's better to do your own work and fail miserably than to do the work of another and succeed. Here, he's refusing to do his own work. She's giving him opportunities to come, to face her, and he is sending other people to do his job. So the next one that he sends is Mahishasura, the buffalo demon. Mahishasura represents rage and lust. Mahishasura is associated with Swadhisthana Chakra. And just when we thought we got our preferences in order, just when we quit smoking, stopped drinking, just when we, just when we change something, suddenly there's anger or desire. Anger, you know, for those in the room who quit smoking at some point in your life, remember what that was like, right? It was like there were a couple of days where like nobody wanted to talk to you <laughs> because the temper was flaring. Yeah. And so when we get the preferences in order, we have to deal with this next level of harm. We have to deal with the rage and with the lust or with the anger and with the desire and bring them under control. So Durga did. Done. Messenger goes back to the demon king and says, it didn't work. She does not desire you. She might be getting a little angry, <laughs> but she doesn't desire you. Durga doesn't get angry. She just does what she's got to do. So he says, okay, send Dumbra Locha. Dumbra means smoke, Locha means eyes. The one with smoke in the eyes, abstract or, or obscured vision. Send her confusion. Send her the inability to see things clearly. Send that demon to her. And so he did. And who do you think won? Durga. Yeah. yeah. So we have Dumbra Locha, who's associated with the Manipura chakra, the power center. Because the action you take is most oftentimes based on the way you see things. And if you see things unclearly, if you see things with confusion, you will most likely commit a harm because you will be reacting and not responding. But if you see things clearly without smoke in your eyes, if you use your inner eye, your spiritual heart, then you will be responsive and not reactive. And so when we introduce Durga into our classroom teachings, this very basic teaching is telling us how to teach the chakras. It's telling us how to teach the student the chakras, how to teach ourselves the chakras that the crux, the base issue is preference, sweet and bitter. 
But don't kid yourself into thinking that just because you quit smoking or just because you quit drinking or just because you quit something, that life is peachy because then you've got to deal with the next two. And the next two are anger and lust. And then don't think that that's enough. Because now you have to deal with the confusion, the blurred vision. Why is there a blurred vision? I just gave up my preferences. I just gave up my anger and my lust. Did you really? Or have you simply substituted one for something else? Sometimes we say, I'm not going to eat chocolate. And we go to popcorn with chocolate on it. (laughs) That's not really chocolate, is it? (laughs) So sometimes... We shift things around so that they look. But when we clear the smoke away, we see very clearly that we've changed very little. We've just redecorated. And then we continue the journey up the chakras, which I don't have time. (laughs) However, we will be talking about this um, in sessions uh, at the ashram on Sundays right now. We're doing sessions on um, this, the goddess scripture. And um, there's two more Sundays that we'll be doing this. And we'll be repeating it in the future. So if any of you are called toward the goddess, maybe it would be something that you would want to stop in and learn about. Or continue learning on your own. There's many, many books out there that can support your journey and support your wisdom and provide you with so much teaching material to share with your students. And so before we end, I'll ask if you have any questions. Is it always necessary to work from the root chakra up? Is that the path of, or can you ever work from the top chakra down? Yeah, it's a great question. And you'll hear different answers to it. Some people say you have to start from the beginning and go up. And other people say that If your practice is focused enough, intentional, honest, and if you're able to shed the skin of the ego like a snake sheds its skin, then you can go right there. Spontaneous enlightenment, spontaneous awakening. But the problem there is Dumbralocha. The necessity for recognizing awakening versus desire to awaken. Do your actions and your lifestyle match up? And so they say, you know, Buddha said, he said, even 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 the great master who's made it to the top of the mountain has to come back down. Come back down into the world of the elements, the world of desire, the world of distractions. And as long as that being is in a physical body, they're susceptible to losing that enlightenment. They're susceptible to returning back to a state of suffering. And as a matter of fact, most will, on and off, back and forth. So spontaneous enlightenment, spontaneous awakening, how can we say it's not possible But before we concern ourselves with, is spontaneous awakening possible for me? Let's ask ourselves another question. Is compassionate living possible for me? Is love possible for me? Is living a life of ahimsa possible for me? And if you master that, the awakening is a no-brainer. Practical, esoteric. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, let's sit up nice and tall. And close the eyes.
and take a breath in and a breath out. And allow your body to absorb, integrate, assimilate any truth that you have heard today. And if there is any part of what you've heard that isn't resonating, then let it go. But above all, Take this moment to set an intention. To be a kind, compassionate teacher. A kind and compassionate student. And a kind and compassionate person. Let us work together to make this world a better place for all beings, to alleviate the suffering of all beings, to realize the light in all beings. Join the hands together in front of the heart. And together we'll chant one beautiful Om and one all beings mantra. And if you know the mantra, please join in. Otherwise, just enjoy. Take a nice breath in for Om. of my own life contribute in some way to that happiness and to that freedom for all. Shanti, 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 Hari Om, Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha, Hari Om. now and always honoring your light, a light of all beings everywhere. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Namaste. Namaste. So nice and blessed to gather with each and every one of you today. Thank you so much for opening up your mind and your hearts. Congratulations on your choices, especially your yoga teacher training. May you have many, many moments of amazingness. Remember, you're never done healing. Your students are never done healing. There's never enough compassion. There is more than enough yoga to go around. The yoga. The yoga. So be that for people. It's needed in the world today. And I do believe I'll see you in the spring. I think I'll be coming back for some Ayurveda, which will be wonderful. And I, maybe I'll see some of you before then as well. So thank you again. Thank you. Have a good night.